Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to FSI 309, uh, main uh, global payments uh, mainframe to microservices. Uh, my name is Bobby Malik. I am a principal solutions architect at AWS. And with me on stage is Gabriel Braslowski, Senior Vice President, Software Engineering, and Krishna Sarvapalli, Senior Director, of Product Engineering. Today, we are here to share with you how Global Payments is migrating their workloads from mainframe to microservices um, and the challenges uh, uh, that they are facing in terms of, uh, sorry, my bad, okay. <laughs> um, sorry, are you good? Okay, um, and the challenges, uh, the business and technical challenges they are facing today during the migration journey. Sorry, it's a little bit distracting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, all right, we'll start. Gabby will start with an introduction uh, to global payments and uh, the scale at which they operate. He will then talk about the business and technology challenges uh, that, are, that they're facing in terms of migration and modernization effort. He'll then talk about the uh, cloud uh, strategies they're adopting uh, during, uh, for migration. Uh, he then, Krishna is gonna talk about the five steps that they've come up with uh, for migrating their uh, critical workloads uh, to AWS uh, on microservices, uh, sorry, uh, using microservices strategy. And then we'll talk about the um, monolithic to microservices strategies and the architectures that they've built. Finally, we'll uh, talk about uh, two uh, critical applications, the messaging and the authorizations application example. Over to Gabby. Thank you, Bobby. Okay, so uh, my name is Gabriel Poslavsky. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing Global Payments to you. So Global Payments is a multinational uh, payments, technology, software, and services company. Uh, as of June 2021, we were named a Fortune 500 company. We serve uh, merchants, issuers, and uh, consumers, and um, we provide a suite of uh, offerings in the payment system and in the commerce ecosystem. So no one else serves the commerce ecosystem and provides a, the, the level of services that we have. We have four million customers, most of them, or starting from a small startups, ambitious uh, startups to very known, famous, and forward-thinking uh, banks and financial institutions at very large, large scales. We have um, 4,000 technology partners, and we serve specific uh, more than uh, 100 verticals. So at the core of what we do, and in order to consume our services and um, our, our payment uh, offerings, we believe in integrations and APIs. So we provide simple, robust, comprehensive uh, integrations so customers can connect to our services. We have API gateways, developer portals, and we provide all the tools and documentation for our customers to connect to our systems. So just uh, in order to uh, grasp the scale in which we operate, uh, we are a $7.4 uh, $7 billion company, and we process about 60 billion transactions a year. If you do some uh, calculations, 60 billion transactions a year means 2,000 transactions on average every second, every second of the day, every second of the week. Um, looking at peak seasons, you know, it's uh, at scale more than 2,000 uh, a second. We serve a 170 plus countries, 400, or sorry, 4 million customer locations, and we have a team of 25,000 innovators and excited employees that are here for, for you. 
A little bit more numbers about the scale. Uh, we have physical presence in 38 countries, so we are a global company, but with a local touch. Uh, 3,500 uh, global sales employees and uh, support staff. So if we break a little bit down the $7.4 billion uh, revenue and we look at the different uh, businesses or line of businesses, we have a very strong merchant solution business. We have a, a, st a strong issuer solutions group, and we also uh, provide business and consumer solutions, uh, namely uh, prepaid, uh, prepaid cards. Okay, let's look at uh, one of our pillars, the merchant solutions group. Uh, we are a leader in merchant, uh, in, in merchant solutions. Our goal is to allow uh, our merchants to process anywhere they are, any sort of uh, payment, uh, payment mechanism, every time, every hour of the day, every second of the day. If we look at different uh, payment options, it, it will inclu include credit cards, debit cards, digital wallets, uh, fingerprinting, face recognition, any type of, of, of available uh, form of payment, QR codes, we would support that and we will, we will enable our clients to connect to the payment networks. We also have specific solutions around 100, uh, in different, uh, about 100 verticals. For example, restaurant chains. We have specific solutions for restauranting. Uh, we have solutions for education. We have solu solutions for healthcare uh, and even sports arenas and stadiums. You know, we power, uh, we power all of these with our technology. So uh, diving into the second pillar, the issuing solution group, is the pre this presentation here is gonna focus on what we're doing with Amazon, with AWS around uh, issuing and our migration there. So we are a leader in issuing, uh, number two in, uh, in Europe. Uh, what is issuing? So issuing, when I go and I apply for a credit card, usually I see the bank and there's a bank label. We are, as Global Payments, providing all the services and mechanism to, to enable that to happen. So what does that mean? Uh, starting from origination, I go and apply for a credit card and they, there's a credit check and you, and you get some sort of um, available balance. It's our engine that determines all of that. Uh, we produce the card, physical production of the cards. We ship it to you. You see, you see a different label, you see a different brand, but we ship it to you. We manage the day-to-day uh, -day authorization, every minute uh, authorization and fraud detection and risk. Th the, we are the ones that, that, that yes, yes, we approve this or this or no, this is fraudulent. At the end of the day, uh, when, the, when the transaction posts, it's us doing it. Um, Statements you know, that you see through your bank account, we drive it through APIs. We send the letters. Uh, even when you get notifications around uh, exceeding some, some you know, ba based on your preferences, exceeding some balances, we actually send the SMS to you or drive it through webhooks through your, through your bank, and then you get your, your notifications. So all of that. So maybe you, don't, you, you haven't heard of the, of the name Global Payments, but we're doing a bunch, of that, uh, a bunch of that stuff behind the scenes. Okay, so why are we moving to the cloud? Um, so we want to support uh, open banking protocols. We want to support modern protocols um, that, you know, when we have our core mainframe solutions that were driving this for many years, these were not available, these were not needs. Uh, when I talk about open banking, it's APIs that allow third parties to connect to the data and uh, bring additional added value solutions and uh, added, added uh, value offerings. Speed to market worldwide. So as you, have you seen, we are all over the world. There are different needs. There are different uh, scaling requirements. There are different uh, computing requirements. There's privacy, data residency requirements. So by leveraging Amazon or by leveraging, leveraging AWS's network, we can be anywhere we need. We can deploy anywhere we need. We also want to break down our big monolithic offer that is uh, currently living in mainframe 
break it into specific APIs, break it into specific consumable web services, so we have more uh, flexibility around what we offer to our customers. And uh, you know, that, that will, uh, by its own will lead to fric a frictionless digital uh, customer experience where we can customize and personalize what our, uh, what our customers want. So some of the business challenges um, we've talked about expanding into different geographies, supporting loads in different geographies, supporting uh, regulatory needs in different places, data privacy, data residency, you, the data has to be in the country, so we have to be there, uh, managing a growing infrastructure, compute, uh, always, there's always a demand for more compute as we expand, as we grow, as uh, more payment options are, are made available, we have to scale for that. Um, we need to plan for uh, seasonal spikes. Last week, Black Friday, you know, a lot of, lot of transactions coming in. So we have to, 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 to accommodate that. But we, don't, we also want to be responsible around how we spend our money and how do we spend on compute. compute. So we want to have the elasticity there. Uh, we want to quickly prototype and innovate. We, can, uh, we want to build environments, test it out, run POCs, connect with customers, Expand it or throw it away, it depends on what we need. And all of that, you know, in an environment where talent is difficult to find, difficult to, to preserve, so, you know, we're always expected to do more with uh, not really a growing number of uh, available resources. Um, more into some of the migration challenges. So we've talked about security. That's our number one uh, concern, that we, you know, we need to get that in place. Uh, regulations, um, card information, personal information, local regulations, ro local rules, all of this, you know, have to be part of the design, have to be part of, a, of our thought process before we even uh, put a single line of code out there. Uh, I think it's clear our applications are mission critical. You can't just uh, switch it off, switch it on another day when you're ready. You know, this migration needs to happen in parallel. We need to, be, to serve our customers on the old platform, build it in the new platform, have an ability to gradually move workloads, sign up new customers on the new environment, start migrating maybe uh, whenever we're ready, when the contracts are ready, when the, when, when the clients are ready. It all has to happen with a low laten latency and high throughput. You know, we can say a lot of things about mainframe, but it's fast, it delivers, now we have to kind of match that in the cloud. And it's not easy. It's not easy, and that's what, I, that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, over the years, we've built a diverse number of workloads. Guess what? We need to rebuild them. We need to recreate them and provide the same, maybe not the same tools, but we need to uh, provide similar services, and not just similar, but more and, and mod more modern. Uh, so we've got REST APIs, SOAP APIs, XMLs. Some customers connect directly to our mainframe through our uh, messaging queues. We need to provide an alternative for that. There is um, different uh, form factors, mobile, web. All of that needs to be included in our, in our new workloads. And by the way, we're talking about 100 different applications, 100 different workloads that have to be built in the cloud. And each one is a massive project. Each one is like hundreds of years of, of, of development. Um, there's a lot of batch processing that happens. We get files from customers overnight. We need to process these files, and we'll need to find a way to do it in, uh, in the cloud. Uh, Real-time applications, uh, of course, uh, another, another need we have. On top of everything, um, we want to have a data mesh, a data lake, provide the visibility, the reporting, analytics for our customers, all of these kind of categories need to be built in the cloud. Okay, I'll pass it on to Krishna. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Gabby, for setting up the context about global payments. Uh, really appreciate covering uh, the merchant and issuing side of the business uh, and the challenges that we, are, we have faced in the mainframe world. Hey everyone, this is Krishna Sarvepalli, father of two lovely kids, 
husband of only one wife. <laughs> Just kidding. So let's start with um, how our monolithic application is looking in the current mainframe world. So as you can see on the left side, the building blocks, as Gabby has mentioned, the issuing business is all about the credit card aspect of it. For example, a client or the customers of a client wants to apply a credit card, they're gonna to go to a website, they will enter the details, SSN, first name, last name, address, all the information, and finally when they submit, this global payments will take care of uh, validating whether they have enough credit and try to approve or decline your credit card. So at that time, all the data, it can be the account information, customer information, everything will be sitting in the mainframe, which is your mainframe IMS data store. So as Gabby has mentioned, there are other sorts of credit card functionalities that we are supporting, like authorizations, statements, posting, communications. All these are part of the mainframe IMS data store, which is a monolithic data store, which, is sitting, which was built from last 40 years. So over the years, we have built so many applications on top of it. There are thousands, 10 thousands of tables available in the IMS store or the segments available in the store. Our challenge was how you'll be able to break it down and migrate to the cloud. At the same time, you want to make sure that you are not disturbing any of the current workloads. As Gabby mentioned, we are serving across the globe with 170 plus merchants and clients. There should not be any downtime for the clients, even as part of the migration as well. And at the same time, we want to provide an opportunity for our newer clients to directly deploy to the cloud. If you look at on the right side, so we with a layering architecture, any, any business, the fundamental is your data store. So we started with our data approach first. The fundamental layer, we call it as a system of record data. Earlier I talked about the accounts and customers that are part of the mainframe, how you'll be able to take it and migrate to the cloud without impacting any of the existing business. And the second layer on top of it is Overall, for the microservices approach or for the modernization work streams, we want to make sure that we are providing unified approach for the hosting. What we started with is Kubernetes-based approach, a Docker mechanism, standards, come up with the base frameworks, base Docker images, which provides an ability that you can easily spin up any of your workloads and maintain standard across the enterprise Compliance, governance, security, all are baked into your hosting model itself. And next, next layer comes to our core processing systems. Authorizations, which requires close to 4,000 to 5,000 transactions per second during the peak day, we want to make sure that we are bring those core processing systems upfront. Every client, for example, once you log into your web application, you want to see the data. You want to see your balances. You want to see your statements. All of that are exposed as open APIs to the clients. So all of our clients utilizing thousands of APIs that we have built and make it available as open API strategy, and clients are looking at our dev portal and understanding how to integrate with, our, with global payments. And the final is all of our web applications, mobile applications, SaaS-based, all of them are also driven based on these microservice internal APIs and the APIs that are exposed, exposing the data. You see the tiny little dots which are going from monolith to microservices. That notates the migration of your workload. It's not going to be a one-time approach. You want to take one by one workload and how will you be able to make it into the cloud without impacting the business. This slide has a lot of information. I'm gonna divide in such a way that I will go segment by segment. The center, the center part of it is talking about purely the data aspect of it. So he, earlier I mentioned about the system of record, which contains account and customer information, which is a building block for every use case. For example, you want to do an authorization. What you need to have is, whether the card is in good shape or not, whether the account is in good shape or not, 
which you will be able to get it from the system of record database, and there are microservices built on the SOR, and you will have diversified workloads. It's not gonna fit one size for every work stream. We have data stores. We have workloads built based on DynamoDB, where you need multi-region active-active strategy. We are using uh, RDS Oracle. We are using Postgres, RDS Aurora, I'm sorry, uh, for maintaining the configs. We are using AWS DocumentDB for JSON-based approaches. So there are applications catered to the specific data store that we need to use, and it is built across the SOR. So you see the in the middle, sorry. Sorry. You see the middle SOR and the top layer consists of all these data stores. That's what I was referring. And we have built the SaaS tools as well as part of the middle layer, which provides the ability for client configurations, branding aspects of it, or our engagement applications. All these data stores are backed by the PCI PI compliance. So the reason you see the Redis or the memory DB, the purpose of the memory DB is, as we deal with a lot of credit card data, we have the PCI PI data that is stored in across every data store. We want to make sure the data is secured before we move to the persistent layer. All your data, the PCI PI is tokenized, and it is in the PCI zone at the Redis layer, and you will have the token information. For example, you have a card number. The card number will not be stored across every data store. Only the tokenized version will be stored in all of our data stores. On the left side is the access patterns. Once you have the, once you solve the data aspect of it, how are you gonna provide access from your applications or your workloads? As Gabby mentioned, we have diversified workloads which are based on APIs, gRPCs for low, low latency. We have event streaming applications. We have batch-based applications. We deal with a lot of files for the posting aspects of it. All of them are accessing the data which are in the center. And towards the right, you see the data lake aspects of it, which we have built for the reporting layer or analytics aspect of it. We want to provide a better experience to our clients and customers in such a way that they will be able to see the information in a meaningful way from all these data stores. So a CDC approach has been built from all these micro stores to, to transfer the data to the data lake and you'll have analytics platform built on top of it so that it's available for our customers. Over to you, Gabby. Okay, I've got an interesting slide to cover here, but before I get to that, I was requested to project my personality. So, I am known to be a little bit nerdy, nerdy quirky, you know, on my previous team, we called the team the DAD team. It extended for data application delivery, but we were also known for our DAD jokes. So I'm going to do my best to project a DAD joke related to mainframe as well. So why are assembly programmers always soaking wet? Because they work below sea level. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this was successful. I actually prepared another one for you. So what kind of a wild animal has only two states, jumping out and scaring you or not? A boo lion. Okay, so going back to the presentation here. Okay, so um, when we build modern applications in the cloud while maintain our current offerings in the on-prem or on our mainframe. The big question is how do you do it in parallel? And it always comes back to data. How do you get the data? How can you drive your applications through the right data? So this is what we came up with. It's called Data Sync. And uh, you, we've got different uh, data repositories on mainframe. The bigger, biggest one is the IMS. We have also DB2 and vSAM. And we want to replicate that near real time, almost real time, as fast as possible to the cloud. 
So we are using a product called uh, SQ Data. It's a CDC uh, component that reads through mainframe logs. And just, um, you know, being domain agnostic, just takes the packages and shoot it through a publisher mechanism to the next component, component which is the SQ Data Apply Engine. What does the Apply Engine do? Looks at very basic information on these packages and says, is it relevant for the cloud or not? Is this a customer that we care about and we need that information in the cloud? Or is this customer have not, have not been migrated and we don't need to kind of uh, have that load over the network? Uh, after the, uh, now, the, this runs on-prem, but not in the mainframe environment. Uh, from there, uh, through another uh, Kafka streaming uh, uh, component, it gets to the tokenization engine that Krishna talked about tokenizes PII, tokenizes PCI, shoots it over the network to AWS, we use a, a managed Kafka um, in AWS, and it gets to our consumer engines that are uh, Kubernetes on, on managed Kubernetes in AWS. What they do is they take these packages that were kind of transparent till that point, they open them up, and look uh, at what, there, what, what is there, do some basic minor transformations and hydrate the different data sources that we care about, like um, Oracle, like DynamoDB, and any other data source that we need. This is infrastructure that happens regardless of the applications. So when we go and deploy an application, we don't have to worry about the dependencies. Or of course, we need to worry about it, but it's a smaller problem because we can deploy applications separately and they can work because they've got their data, and that data is, you know, maybe 100 or 200 milliseconds old. So, so it's, it's near real time. Okay, so um, as we've gone through this, and we talked about maybe 100 or even more, more, 100, more than 100 applications, we took this, the 6R approach. Uh, there's a link here by Stephen Orban. And this is how we determine what, what, what work needs to happen. What do we need to do? So some applications we need to retain. Um, there's card manufacturing. It's going to be on-prem. Oh, on Still going to be there. No, no way to go, go around it. Some applications we can retire because we built mo modern versions of it. So we, we don't need to migrate. Um, if you get lucky, you could just re-host. Uh, put a development pipeline and, and, and just deploy what you've got. Um, usually that's not the case. Usually even if you need to move it, you need to modernize it. You need to re-platform. So it's a lift, tinker, modify, and shift. Also, you get lucky if you get to do that. Um, when we use third parties, uh, there's repurchasing of tools that are, uh, you know, work better in the cloud or, or uh, meet our modern needs, and a big chunk of it, 65% of it or 70% or of it, uh, we're going to refactor, we're going to re rebuild, basically rebuild from, from scratch, reanalyze the requirements, see what makes sense, come up with new requirements as well, and uh, build it with modern, uh, modern technology, and that's what, that's what Krishna is going to be talking about more next. Thank you, Gabby. As Gabby mentioned, uh, the 6R strategies. So how are you going to take your workload from mainframe to the cloud? It's not going to fit every work stream to transfer in one go. You need to come up with a strategy. You need to lay out frameworks. You need to have foundations in which you will be able to design or structure the patterns for the migration. We came up with the five strategies five steps, how our enterprise will be going to take all the workloads to the cloud environment. So I'm going to talk about those five steps. So the first one is build canary migration. Within your system, or within our system, I'm sorry, we have internal applications that are used by the specific workloads. We have SaaS-based products, which are internal only. 
at first what we started was we figured out how we'll be able to take them to the cloud without impacting the clients. And the other approach, what we started was, which is the biggest, the data aspects of it. It can be SR, it can be data analytics, reporting aspects of it, how you're gonna consider that workload to migrate to the cloud. And the next one is your access patterns, your APIs, your batches, your gRPC, streaming, all those workloads. Categorize all of them in such a way that you will be able to come up with the best approaches to migrate them to the cloud. And finally, our bread and butter, which is nothing but our core processing systems. And the second step is, we worked with our DevOps Center of Excellence team and came up with a plan how you're gonna come up with, how you're gonna solve security aspects, compliance aspects, governance, and we came up with a cloud baseline approach. So the purpose of the cloud baseline is, as I mentioned, there are diversified workloads. We are across the global. How you'll be able to come up with producing the accounts? There is a account vending machine using infrastructure as code-based approach. We use behind the scenes Terraform and service catalog and AWS organizations to spin up any of the accounts in a controlled and structured fashion. For example, in case of authorizations platform, we want to make sure that that account is isolated and we are not disturbing the traffic with other workloads because your quotas, your limits are at the account level. So you need to come up with a plan how you'll be able to create the accounts in such a way that your workloads are streamlined and governed by your security aspect. And the third step is, which Gabby has talked about, the data aspect of it. SOR is, which is nothing but our system of record, there is no way that you're gonna take all the data in one go, every client data, customer data, that is available in the mainframe world to shift it directly to the cloud. Gabby talked about one of the ways, which is data sync, where you're gonna use the CDC-based approach and you're gonna take the changes that happened in the monolith mainframe IMS and move it to the cloud. And the second access pattern that we have built, which is innovative, is data fabric which is a central point to access the data for the mainframe. I'm gonna cover a little bit more about the data fabric in the future slides. And data fabric is based on a CQRS pattern where you can request the data from the mainframe directly, you can make the changes, you can query request, all those aspects are built into the data fabric. Sorry. And the fourth one is repeatable frameworks. Across the enterprise, we have applications, we have APIs, we have gRPC batches, event-based, there are web applications, there are streaming-based applications. What we, what we started with is a simple framework-oriented approach and provide to the whole enterprise. How it has helped us is all our scrum teams, all our work streams, they're gonna just make use of these frameworks. I will take one simple example. Let's say you wanna build an API. The API requires authentication, authorization, billing aspects, tracing. You need a lot of cross-cutting concerns that every team needs to worry about. Rather than that, what we came up with an approach is a simple framework-oriented approach. We provided frameworks to the whole enterprise. There's an architectural team which builds the framework and handed it over to the, across the enterprise. And the business functionality teams or work streams are just concentrated on how they can write their APIs. It provides a unified approach. It provides a standard across the company. And we want to make sure we are providing an ability for upgrades, maintenance in a stream-oriented approach. And you need to make sure that all your workloads across the work streams across the enterprise, adhere to it. So we have built a pipelines in such a way that we're gonna do linting, we're gonna do the verifications, whether the, every workload is following that or not. And the last one is fail fast approach. When we started, the journey was started almost close to three years. 
I'll tell you one scenario. When we started the authorizations workload, we started with Oracle RDS database. We quickly realized it's not gonna solve our multi-region active-active need. We worked with the AWS team. We migrated to DynamoDB immediately, okay? It has happened within a couple of months. Later we realized, okay, it's not gonna start solve our needs. So the thinking from your engineering teams was supposed to be a fail-fast model where you will be able to quickly adapt the new, new things, new changes, and you'll be able to migrate to the new systems immediately. And the next one is the canary-based pattern. So when you are deploying new code, you want to make sure that you are not creating any impact to the clients. So we have adapted canary patterns across the work streams with V1 or V2 model, and there is a traffic verification, monitoring aspects of it built across the enterprise, a templating mechanism for customizations for the canary verification. And the last one is make customers part of the journey. It can be your product teams, business teams, in fact, your clients as well. So Gabby mentioned about the card manufacturing system. When we migrated, when we modernized the cards platform, we were able to get a contract with City, and we were able to migrate their newer workloads directly to the newer system. I will, I will explain how we have solved it for a couple of use cases. And the last one is take advantages with AWS services. So for example, you don't need to start from scratch if you use the managed services. For example, MSK, which we are using, or EKS, which we are using. So we don't need to worry about the maintenance aspect of any of those clusters and the migration services as well for transmitting the data, for transferring the data. So next I'm gonna co cover about a couple of use cases. The first one is messaging modernization. We talked about mainframe a lot. How do you get the data out of the mainframe? Earlier we talked about one simple scenario where we created a customer and account information in the mainframe. On the right side, you can see it's gonna sit it in, in the IMS in a segment-oriented approach. Think like segment is like a table, okay? We call it as AM and CM, account master and customer master. All the data is structured in the mainframe. And you have other databases in the mainframe as well. There's a DB2 for the configuration aspect of it. There are little older ones, vSAM-based approach, which is a file-based approach as well. So the data is available in the mainframe, IMS stores, and multiple data stores. So as of now, currently, think about how customers are accessing that information. So there is a CICS program, which is in the middle, the red dots. All those are access patterns or maintenance aspect of it. They're gonna query the data from the IMS and make it available for the clients using MQ-based pattern. So as of now, all the clients, when they want to see, for example, they want to see a balance for a specific customer. They're gonna put an MQ request, which will gonna trigger a CSES program, go and grab the data from IMS, and make it available in the response queue. You see on the left side, um, what we initially started with is not to migrate or not to take every workload, we have built a API-based pattern, a simple API-based pattern on top of these MQs, okay? And we have exposed all those APIs to the customers, the newest customers, who are getting onboarded onto the global payments platform. They, they are all integrating with API-based, a simple REST-based approach. So a simple solution on top of the MQ to expose the APIs, and we were able to sell this to a lot of customers in the first initial two years of our modernization. And as part of the migration journey, so on the top you can see it's the same workload, there is no change, mainframe, CACS programs, getting the data from all the data stores. On the right side you see there is a, sorry, my bad. On the right side there is a data sync which Gabby has explained to transfer any of the changes from mainframe data stores to the cloud. So there are diversified data stores. Again, you have Oracle Service, you have Options, which is nothing but your client configurations. You have Data Lake, there are several data stores that are available. Before, before that, what we have built is a data fabric layer. 
It's a central funnel to retrieve or perform any maintenance, which is nothing but your put or post commands from any of these data stores. So initial migration, how we have started with this, all the reads are going to the cloud-based approach from the data fabric. All the writes are still going back to your SOR, which is nothing but your IMS data source. All these work streams, there are authorizations, payments, accounts, all the microservices, there will be, they all will be going to integrate with the data fabric as a single funnel. And data fabric takes care of the responsibility of it knows whether it is a get call, whether it is a put post call, and it directs the traffic in such a way that there won't be any impact or there won't be any rights onto the cloud-based databases. This is the first step that we have started because we don't want two sets of truth in the world, right, within our system. So always the rights goes to the SOR and from there the data will be sent back using data sync to all our cloud-based data stores. Now, Gabby has mentioned about um, the client migration aspects of it. But this, it's a biggest challenge because we have hundreds of customers which are using our platform in the on-prem right now in the mainframe world. How do we get an issue? How do we provide an assurance? How do we get confidence from the business or from the product teams or in fact from the clients? How do you say that our newer platform which we have built did not break anything and it's gonna work exactly the same way as mainframe. So what we started is, once we developed this microservices and data fabric, we deployed all our services in, in the production environment. Whenever a request comes in, earlier I talked about a simple REST API channel, which is actually sending based on the MQ and grabbing the data from mainframe. We have built a simple asynchronous approach there because we don't want to add any latency to the clients. And asynchronously, it's going to send a request to the newer microservices that we have built. And after processing from the newer microservices, you're going to take the source, whatever that was happened in the existing system. You're going to take the response, whatever that was happened in the newer system. We have stored that information. There are comparison aspects that we have built on top of it. Uh, we went back and fixed a few things as well based on the responses. And we have deployed this in UAT environment for almost like four to six months to gain the confidence from the business. So we published the stats, we have fixed so many, we have sent so many iterations as well to make sure our code is identical to what mainframe is providing. Even when we want to migrate to the cloud in the production environment, we went with a canary-based approach. That's what I was referring earlier. So as part of the canary-based approach, for example, there are, so there are two different types of um, data, data patterns right now, or the request patterns, I'm sorry. If it is an API-based approach, which are all our newer clients, they will be directly sending to the newer microservices, and we will figure out whether it is a moderation API, whether it's a non-moderation API, based on that, we'll reroute the traffic. Similarly, on the older, older systems, where the clients are directly accessing based on the MQ-based pattern, we built a custom router Based on the custom router, we know whether the packet or whether the XML request is modernized or non-modernized, you will be able to route the traffic. So it's not like we're gonna put everything in one shot, so you're gonna prove it to the business, you're gonna prove it to the clients, saying it's not gonna break anything. That's when actually we came up with parallel testing and canary-based mechanisms for the traffic migration. Hope you guys are able to follow the XMLM messaging aspect of it. I'm gonna talk about the another innovative product that we have built, auth authorizations, modernization platform. It's almost like one and, one and a half to two years that we have worked on this platform. As Gabby mentioned, the requirements for auth modernization, authorizations is very tricky. Let's talk about, first of all, what is authorization? Just to give you a little context about authorization, everybody uses credit card. When you go to a merchant location, when you swipe your credit card, the first thing it will do is, based on your card, it's gonna to go to the merchant bank. Global Payments is, works on the both the sides, merchant side and issuer side both. After the merchant, it's gonna to go to your card networks. So whatever the card type that you're using, 
It can be Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Discover, across the globe, different, different types of networks. Based on that, it's gonna to go to the, the card network. From there, they will be redirecting to the payment processor. So global payments is one of the payments processor. So for all of our clients, they will detect and they will figure out it was supposed to be sent to the global payments. Once we receive that request, we're gonna take a look at again in our mainframe or microservices in the existing world and newer world, and either approve or decline that authorization. Finally, give a thumbs up or thumbs down whether it is in good shape or not for your authorization. Okay, so for the newer platform, what is, what is our goal? How do you want to solve it? The first and foremost for our auth modernization is supporting multiple geographies. We want to go globally where our existing mainframe or existing system cannot go immediately or in a sequential or maybe scale-based approach. For example, we want, to, we want to deploy in maybe a country where we are not offering currently, which we should be able to do it in a pretty quick fashion if you are in the cloud. And the second thing is our code base. Earlier I talked about the framework-oriented approach. We have trickled down a little bit more lower level. Gabby has mentioned about the issuing business, which we are doing is multiple platforms. It can be consumer, which just like us, commercial, like you get the corporate cards, and debit, and healthcare, which is your uh, FSA and HSA cards. So we take care about a lot of different platforms, and the code base is completely different in the existing world. It's different across the geographies as well. But in the newer platform, what we want to come up with is, we want to come up with a one, one code base approach, one framework oriented approach, where you're gonna provide the functionality as features where you can turn on or turn off, okay? And the next one is high throughput and low latency. In the, in the current world, authorizations platform, on a peak day, it supports around 4,370 transactions. In the newer world, what we want to achieve is 10,000 transactions per second. We want to make sure that we are performance testing. We are making sure that our platform is scalable in the cloud, minimum of 10,000 transactions per second. And the next one is security aspect. As I mentioned earlier, all our data, we want to make sure at the persistent layer, everything is tokenized. So I'm going to cover a little bit more later. And last but not least, which is the multiple, multi-region active-active. The name sounds good, but solving is a very, very pain, okay? We'll, we'll go through it. So this is the architecture, how you're getting the traffic. Earlier, I talked about Visa, MasterCard, Amex, which they are sending the traffic to the TSIS payment, uh, global payments payment processor. As of now, how it works is we, got, we, we are establishing a socket-based connection to Visa MasterCard. So we don't want to touch the thin layer. We want to keep the thin layer on the on-prem itself. The, there are various reasons for it, because if you want to migrate to the cloud from the card networks, we need a support from them as well, which we are working for the second phase. Initially, what we started was we started integrating and put, keeping the thin layer on the on-prem itself. And the thin layer takes care of establishing the connection to all these card networks, perform the tokenization aspect of it, so that before going to the cloud itself, all the data is tokenized. And from there, the traffic goes in a multi-region active-active fashion. So we are using AWS Direct Connect, and we are using multiple regions as well. Once the traffic lands onto the other side, we are using DynamoDB for maintaining account information. DynamoDB, first of all, why DynamoDB? As you all know, Dynamo is, has a global table approach. It supports multi-region as a managed service, which you don't need to bother about a lot. There are edge cases which you need to take care. But, and another thing is, Dynamo supports single-digit millisecond latency. So we worked with the AWS team a lot and came up with our query patterns and write, write patterns. We, we optimized, tuned a lot in such a way that we'll be able to reduce that, the single digit millisecond latency as well. So once the traffic lands onto the cloud, we are using DAX for the reads, which is backed by the DynamoDB, and we are using Aurora to maintain our configurations. First of all, what, what is the configuration? Why do we need it? 
as I mentioned, we cater about 100 plus clients. The configurations for a specific one client will be completely different from another. For example, when you go to an ADM, you can say like, I want to decline the authorization if the pin is invalid for five times. Another client can say, I want to decline the subsequent authorizations as well if the pin is invalid for 10 times. So you see those kind of configurations are completely available in the Amazon Aurora DB and it's replicated across the cluster, sorry, across the regions as well. Now coming to the router, how you are routing the traffic from on-prem to the cloud. So how do you make sure your workloads or you are leaving the data in a consistent manner one software you serve the traffic in an active active pattern. Earlier I talked about a couple of platforms. One is consumer, one is commercial. In case of consumer, what we are doing is we are going with a simple even odd card based pattern. In case of a commercial, we are going with client based approach or customer based approach. Let's look at a, let's look at the, the a simple problem how we have solved for the data consistency aspect of it. For example, so the, there are scenarios in consumer platform as well. For example, let's say you have a family card. You're going to share that card with uh, your kids as well. Okay? They both will be representing the balance, the sim single account balance in the background. So that means, for example, when you swipe or your kid swipes, they both are supposed to go to the same account balance attribute. So what we came up with an approach is a simple partitioning even for, uh, the, even for the balances as well. So when the traffic comes in both the regions for the same card or a family card, we want to make sure that we are adjusting the attribute specific to the region itself. What it will provide is, it will make sure that when replicated, if there is a lag, it's not going to create any data consistency issues or it's not going to override the existing data. So some of the things which we have solved in a very innovative manner will be going to be helpful uh, for other work streams as well. And once software all our development is completed, we ran performance, we tuned a lot, we worked with the AWS teams, and our goal of achieving 10,000 transactions per second under a latency of 100 milliseconds, which is what the gave, we were able to achieve within 70 milliseconds itself on an average. And finally, the optimization aspects of it. So Dynamo reads and writes, we went with a batch-oriented approach where you'll be able to send all your queries in one shot. And for, after every, every performance test, we went back and looked into the Dynamo stats, how it is looking. How is, uh, what is the read, read latency? What is the write latency? How many transactions it is handling? How many RCs or WCs it is consuming? What is the replication lag when it is switching from one region to another region? So all these stats are constantly monitored after every performance test. We worked for almost three to four months with AWS teams to resolve some of those latency issues as well. Yeah, that's all with respect to the auth modernization. And the next steps, so we talked about uh, their diversified workloads. We talked about only a couple of use cases, which is auth and XMLM. There are tons of workloads which we are supposed to migrate as well. So these two use cases, what I talked about, are the stepping stones for the remaining workloads. And we're going to take the, remaining, the next set of apps, the postings, data subscriptions, the customer onboarding statements to the cloud in next few years. Thank you, thank you all.